Hey, glad that you are with us. Really excited for this weekend for a couple of reasons. Uh, first and most primarily is that our amazing Loft Ministry assistant, Connie Wilson, is back with us. So uh, if you're new, Connie makes everything around here happen. She is amazing. We have missed her dearly. Uh, and over the past six, seven weeks, she has been on an exotic vacation uh, called maternity leave. I don't know what that means, but uh, we're so excited to have her back. I don't, uh, I don't usually like to speak poorly of people from the pulpit, but uh, I feel it's necessary here. I, I just want to say Connie's replacement uh, was really, really bad at the job, let things fall through the cracks, emails were late, questions were not answered. Uh, he did a really terrible job, and he is me, okay? I had to fill in, and I was really bad at it. We're glad that Connie is with us. Uh, but also excited for this weekend because we are kicking off this little three-week sermon series called Speakeasy. And you just kind of watch the, the, the fun little bumper there. Uh, and, and so you would probably guess from those words that were on the screen, and this may be a disappointment, but Speakeasy is not a sermon series about drinking, okay? We're not talking about that. We're not handing out cocktails on the way out. Uh, it, 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 we're not. And if that uh, doesn't make sense to you, this idea of a speakeasy, I had to do some research on it this week on the almighty Wikipedia. And, and what I learned was this, a, a speakeasy, um, it, it got this term, this idea, idea during a, a very interesting time in American history called Prohibition. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with that time, during Prohibition, uh, the United States outlawed the sale and the consumption of alcohol. And, and so what would happen is that uh, people who wanted to like double sin, who wanted to break the law and enjoy some illegal liquids, uh, they began to form these kinds of bars, these kinds of clubs that were called speakeasies. And the reason they were called speakeasies is because the people who, who would uh, frequent said establishments to get their illicit liquid, um, they had to be very careful about the way they talked about these establishments. Uh, they didn't want to tip off law enforcement. They didn't want to get in trouble. So they had to speak easily about it. And then I'm told that once you got inside of the establishment, double sinning there, once you got inside the establishment, you had to speak very softly. I would not have been invited. I would have kicked out very early on. But you had to speak very quietly and softly and easily so that people outside didn't know what was going on on the inside. And so we've taken this idea of speaking easily of speaking gently to talk about something that uh, is kind of a bad word in modern church world, and that is evangelism. Okay, so originally, over the next three weeks, we're, we're gonna be talking about evangelism. Today is gonna be kind of the why, and then uh, the next two weeks are gonna get more practical, the kind of how. And so we had thought about just labeling this series what it is. And so we had talked about when we were workshopping this series, calling this series, What is Evangelism? And Pastor Luann made a really great point. We were moving in that direction. She said, hey guys, let's, let's take a beat. Uh, let's take a moment because evangelism is kind of a bad word. And I got to thinking about that and that's probably pretty true. When I say the word evangelism, my suspicion is you think of what I think of. And that's one of two things. Either one, we hear the word evangelism and we think of this kind of derivation of the word evangelical. Okay, which used to not be a bad word. It was a description for a certain flavor of Christianity. But now in our modern political vernacular, it's, a, it's kind of a political wing. And so you hear that and you think evangelism, evangelical. I might be that, but I might not be. And I don't want to talk about politics. And so I want to avoid the conversation altogether. And if you don't think about the political realm of it, I don't know about you, but when I think of evangelism, I have an image pop in my mind of um, a man on a street corner with a sign and a bullhorn. Okay, you, you've probably seen these types of people before that uh, you're just out for a nice stroll on Main Street, getting your ice cream and your latte. And then you see a guy on the street corner with a sign about how everyone, including you, is going to hell and a bullhorn yelling at you about your sin. And if we think of that as evangelism, then, then no wonder we kind of uh, ha have a little bit of bias against it. But let me tell you this, um, kind of our big idea for this series uh, is that evangelism is all about relationships. Okay, in my 32 years of life, in my few years of ministry, I've had a lot of conversations with people about how they came to faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of people will say, hey, I, I kind of grew up going to church and uh, my parents brought me there and then I went off to a church camp when I was in junior high or senior high. I met the Lord there. I got baptized. My life has never been the same since. I hear a lot of those stories. 
I hear a lot of stories of people saying, uh, you know, I, I kind of walked my own path. I did my own thing. I tried to live life by my own rules and I ended up in the pit. Broken relationships, addictions, financial woes, and then a, a coworker, a friend, a spouse invited me to church and there I found Jesus and then I found my hope. I hear a lot of stories like that. Let me tell you, and maybe it's just me, not once have I ever heard a story about coming to faith in Jesus Christ like this. While well, I was just walking down Main Street, eating my ice cream and getting my latte, and there was a dude on the corner yelling about me, about how because I had tattoos and holes in my jeans, I was going to hell, and that made sense to me, so I gave my life to Jesus, and nothing's been the same since. Okay, maybe that story exists, but I have never heard it. Instead, evangelism is about relationships. And what we wanna do in this series, especially as we lead up to fall, when back, back to school is coming, when back to school happens, people are more likely to try out a church, to try out something new and a new routine. And we wanna empower and equip you as a congregation of how to share your faith, the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. And what I wanna show you is that it's not just my job. It's not just Pastor Luann's job. It is primarily our job together to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody that we meet. Okay, so this morning, as we go through the why of evangelism, why are we called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm gonna kind of bookend this message with two of the greatest sayings of Jesus. Okay, we're gonna start with what's called the good commandment, the great commandment, and then we're gonna look at the great commission. Great commandment, great commission. What we're gonna find in both is that Jesus is giving us this mission to love our neighbors and to preach the gospel. Okay, so let's start with Mark chapter 12. It's the great commandment. Here's what it says in verse 28. It says, and one of the scribes came up to Jesus and he had heard him disputing with one another, with other scribes, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, this man asked, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is this, what's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second one is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So I love the honesty of the scribe in this situation, in this story with Jesus. All right, here's kind of how I picture the scribe, and maybe you've thought this way before too. The scribe comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I don't know if you realize this, but the Bible is really stinking long. Okay, a lot of words, a lot of chapters, a lot of thou shalts and a lot of thou shalt nots. And he says, hey, could you just give me the Cliff Notes version? Are right, you remember the Cliff Notes and what's got me through the high school? I'm not gonna read all of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. I'm gonna read the Cliff Notes version. That's what he's asking for here. Hey, let me tell you, if you're new to the faith, if you pick up one of our Bibles on the way out, that's what you're gonna find. You're gonna find a lot of words, a lot of chapters, a lot of pages, a lot of commandments. And he just says, could you distill it down a little bit? And he says, very simply, what it means to follow after me, what it means to embody the kingdom is to love God and love neighbor. If you were to sum up all of the commandments, it's love God and love neighbor. And if we're honest, we're, we, we can understand the first part. Right, you, by nature of being here this morning, you kind of know what it means to love God. You know what it means to honor him and to glorify him and to worship him, to commune with him. We get the love God part. It's the love neighbor part that gets a little bit sticky. What does it actually look like to love our neighbor? I wanna give you two big ideas that if Jesus says the most important commands in the Bible is to love God and love neighbor, then we should understand what it means to love our neighbor. And I wanna give you two suggestions. Okay, the first one, I'll go ahead and tell you, I don't like to brag up here. This is my most profound thought that I've probably ever had, and I'm really proud of it, okay? So if you're taking notes, you're gonna wanna jot this down. What does it mean to love our neighbor? Number one is this, be a good neighbor. Now, how do you love your neighbor? Really simply, you start by being a good neighbor. So in Luke chapter 10, we see a similar story to what we just read in Mark chapter 12. A man comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? And he says, love God and love your neighbors. But this man wants to take the conversation a little bit further. Luke chapter 10, verse 29 says this, but he, the man who asked the question, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Can't love a neighbor if you don't know who they are. And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Pause right here. I heard a preacher say this week that any time in the gospels, when you see Jesus ask somebody else a question or start to tell them a story, they're in trouble. 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Key phrase here, now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went up to him and he bound up his wounds and he poured on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn to take care of him. And the next day, the Samaritan took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Okay, so this is the story of what's called the Good Samaritan. And it starts with this basic question of who is my neighbor? And there's so much going on in this story that we could preach for weeks, if not months, if not years about it. Here's what I want you to focus on is that, that phrase by chance. Okay, now I could be wrong here, but I think in this two word phrase, by chance, I tend to think that Jesus is being a little sarcastic. Okay, sarcasm is my love language, so maybe uh, that's just what I think. But I think Jesus is being sarcastic about it because here's what we know. In the kingdom of God, nothing happens by chance. Right, there are no accidents, there are only divine appointments. And so all three of these people, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, they were going about their normal activities. They were just walking down the road like they always did. And then, oh, by chance, they have an opportunity to bless somebody. And the first two who are supposed to step up to the plate, they step to the other side instead. It's the Samaritan who shows mercy, who shows compassion, who is a good neighbor. I think one of the lessons we learn from the story of the Good Samaritan is that being a good neighbor is showing compassion just to the people around you. Right, These three men, the, the, the Levite and the priest and the Samaritan, they didn't get on a plane and go to some foreign country to preach the gospel. They didn't uproot and move to a different neighborhood so that they can love their neighbor. They were going about their daily activities and called to love and show mercy to be a good neighbor to the people around them. About 10 years ago, I read an amazing book that I would highly recommend called The Art of Neighboring. And the basic idea is that we are called to love our neighbor. But uh, Pathak and Runyon, the, the authors of this book, here's kind of the crux, the thesis of their case. They say this. When Jesus was asked to reduce everything in the Bible into one command, he said, love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. And then here's the big question. What if he meant that we should love our actual neighbors? You know, the people who live right next door. They make this case that, that we can think of neighbor being somebody else, somewhere elsewhere, that we're just called to love everybody. But when we get too vague, it's hard to get specific. And so they specifically say, what would it look like to reclaim our modern American neighborhoods as the web, as the locus of social activity? Uh, because here's what we know. We live in a day and an age that, that we don't really know our neighbors. There was a long time in uh, American history where you would know your neighbors. You would care for your neighbors. You would look after your neighbors. You would play with your neighbors. And now what happens? We stand behind and we stay behind the walls of our houses and the fences of our backyards. All right, just a simple illustration of that. Um, if you've noticed over the past 30, 40, 50 years, kids used to play in the front yard and now they play in the backyard. Right, what would happen if they played in the front yard? They'd be playing out in the front yard and then uh, catty corner across the street, those kids are playing out in the front yard and then the kids are now playing together and the families meet. You become neighbors. But now for one reason or another, we've moved everything from the front yard to the backyard. Backyard fences show a lot about what we think about neighboring. Here's another one. The automatic garage door opener. Okay, stick with me here. The automatic garage door opener has transformed negatively neighboring in America. So if you're one of those very few people um, that is able to fit a car in your garage, I'm not, okay? But if you are, here's, here's what used to happen before automatic garage door openers. 
I'm told you would pull up to the garage, you'd have to open up the car door, you'd have to get out of the car, and you would have to lift up the garage door. And what would happen is that while you're doing that, good chances are your neighbor in the driveway next door is doing the same thing. And then you start a relationship, you start a conversation. But now we pull into the driveway, we press the button, we get into our garage, we press it again, it closes and we get out, never having time for interaction with our neighbor. Where instead the call of the Christian to be a good neighbor starts with being a good neighbor. And where it really begins is to change the lens of the way we see our current situation. This is what's called the theology of location. Here's what I know. There is somebody in the room this morning that if you were honest, you hate your job. You hate your boss, you hate your coworkers, you sure hate the salary in this economy, right? You hate it all. But what if you were to change the lens of the way you see your job in this stage of life to realize that God has you there for a purpose? That there is somebody in the office, somebody in the cubicle next to you that needs to know that the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And maybe God has you in that job that you hate for that very purpose. Or maybe some of you, you're sick of your cramped apartment. And you're waiting for that lease to end up. Or, or maybe you live in a 50-year-old house that keeps having all kinds of problems and you want to get out of it now. Anybody? Just me? But maybe, maybe God has you in that cramped apartment to the witness of the person who lives next door to you. Maybe God has you in that house that you don't love because he wants to use you to transform that neighborhood. It starts by being a good neighbor. Okay, so here's your action step this week. I want everyone to participate in this. I want each and every one of us in our homes, in our apartments, wherever we live, to do something to be a good neighbor this week. What does that look like? Bake them cookies. Okay, after the 9.30, a man came up to me and he, he just looked at me and he said, quiche. <laughs> and I said, go on. He said, I'm gonna make them a quiche. And I said, great, make them a quiche, right? Make them something and bring it to them. Now, here's where this gets awkward. Let's be honest. Some of y'all have lived in your house for 10 to 15 years. And the neighbor across the street has lived in that same house for 10 to 15 years and you have never had a conversation with them. And now you've lived there so long, it would be awkward to just say, hey, my name is John, right? This is your icebreaker. Just bring them cookies. If you see that somebody hasn't brought up their trash bins at the end of the day, do that for them. Mow their lawn, cut down a tree that needs to be cut down. I don't know, do something to be a good neighbor. And then, and then here's the, the kind of next step, and, and I may get in trouble for this, but this is what I want you not to do. When you bake them cookies, when you pull up their trash cans, I don't want you to mention Jesus. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to show up on their doorstep with freshly baked chocolate chip cookies and say, here's some cookies. Do you, they're gonna be really sweet. Do you know what's even sweeter? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, don't do that, that's weird. If, if, you're, if you're pulling up their trash can and that trash can spell, smells a little bit like a speakeasy, I don't want you to pull it up then go knock on their door and say, hey, I noticed that you've been drinking some beverages you probably shouldn't. Can I introduce you to the living water of Jesus Christ? That's weird. Like, don't do that. Just be a good neighbor as you build a relationship. Remember, evangelism is all about relationships. And I found this amazing quote from two missiologists about this very thing. They, they talk about the concept of hospitality and hospitality is just being a welcoming and a good neighbor. And here's what they say. They say the aim of hospitality is to forge relationships strong enough to bear the weight of truth. We're hospitable so that we can build relationships. And then once that relationship is strong enough to bear the weight of truth, then we share the truth with them. Now, here's what I know. I, I, I just know my own heart where I'm good up here on a one-on-one -on -one evangelistic level. I'm not good. Okay, I'm not comfortable with that at all. So for a lot of us, what happens is that we believe that, that evangelism is about relationships. And so we're just building that relationship. And 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 it's been 15 years and we've never invited him to church. Okay, the hardest step is the second step. We love our neighbor first by being a good neighbor. And then number two is this, we tell them about Jesus. 
We tell them about Jesus. This is the heart of evangelism, that all of us, professionals and not, we are witnesses of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our call to share that with others. And this mission, this purpose that we have, there's a lot at stake. Okay, if you're kind of new to the law, if you're checking us out, this is gonna be a little bit about what we believe. This may offend some people if I get emails about it. I would love to sit you down and have a conversation with it. Um, we believe that what Jesus says is true. Okay, so we believe that what he says is true. In John chapter 14, verse six, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And then key sentence here, no one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, we believe that Jesus was right here. Okay, we believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father. We believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. We believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Not other world religions, not other leaders, not other philosophies, not other vague ideas of God. Nothing but Jesus Christ will save your soul. Okay, and listen to me. If we believe that, then we realize we have a really important story to tell. Because if we believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, to salvation, to heaven, then we believe that Jesus is the cure for every single human being. And if we have the cure, then I would suggest it would be unloving not to share it with somebody else. Okay, I know that this is a little controversial in our very open, in our very accepting, in our very tolerant world. I get that. Right, but what I'm seeing right now is our Christian overindulgence on tolerance is robbing the gospel of its power. Our desire to not offend and to not hurt feelings and to not uh, have weird relationships, that is robbing the gospel of its power to save souls. In the same way, if you go to the doctor and you have some kind of illness, you have some kind of disease, something is broken within you and the doctor has the cure. But, but they were worried about how you might receive the cure. And so they're, they're not gonna tell you the cure and they're gonna send you on your way. That's malpractice and that's not loving. So if we believe that we have the cure, if we believe that we have the, the, the solution for, for the sin sickness of this world, then it is unloving not to share it. And again, it's not just up to me. One of the other lessons in the Good Samaritan is that it should have been the priest the religious professional, and he failed. It should have been the Levite, the one who for generations had tended to the temple of God to be a good neighbor, and it wasn't. Instead, it was the villain of the story, the Samaritan who steps up to the plate, which says that it's not just up to the professionals, it's up to all of us. And I'm always haunted by this thought that Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. Right, the Christian church, the greatest force for good in all of human history, the Christian church is one generation away from extinction. Jesus will still be on the throne. He'll still be the king of the universe. But this amazing force that we have for good is one generation away from dying. All it takes is one generation to not take seriously our mission and our call and our responsibility to share the gospel, to see what we have built completely fade away into oblivion. And listen, it's not our fault of what we've inherited, but we're seeing the seeds of this right now. I can quote all the studies, uh, church attendance on the decline, denominations on the decline over and over and over again. I was having a conversation with a 94-year-old man this, uh, this past week. And he began talking about this. We were telling about our church and he said, I'm just so worried about this generation. He said, I grew up going to church. I went to Sunday school. I went to vacation Bible school. That's where I got my foundation in the faith and what it means to be a good and a Christ-like person. And he said, now parents don't take their kids to church. And they don't take their kids to church because they didn't grow up going to church. What happened? One generation got a little bit lax, took their responsibility a little less seriously, and now we're seeing the downstream impacts of it. On our watch, we can't let that happen. And so the hope is that 
Today, you've kind of gotten the, the rah-rah, we've got to go out and share our faith, and we know it's real scary. We're going to talk in the next two weeks, really practical, tactical, how you do that. Your goal today is to be a good neighbor. And then what you'll find is that as you're a good neighbor, you live into the call that God has for your life. The great commandment says, love God and love your neighbor. And then one of the other most famous sayings of Jesus is what's called the Great Commission. He is just resurrected from the dead. He has died an atoning sacrifice for our sins, taking our sins upon him, leaving it in the grave, rising again that we could have abundant and eternal life with him. And this is the first scene that we see after the resurrection. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the 11 disciples, they all went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But I love this, but some still doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus says, love God, love people in the great commandment. And then he says, go therefore and make disciples in the great commission. This is our purpose. May we all not only be good neighbors, but take the call seriously to preach the gospel, to share the reason for the hope that we have because we have a story to tell and we need to tell it. Let me pray for us, Law family. Well, Father, we thank you that the gospel, the good news is a gospel of grace because we know that we are a people who need your grace. Father God, forgive us for the times that we have stepped to the other side of the road, literally or figuratively. We were given an opportunity to show mercy and compassion, but we stepped to the other side of the road, forgive us. When we were given an opportunity to share the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, but we stepped to the other side of the road, God, forgive us when we could have been a good neighbor, but we stepped to the other side of the road. And Father, thank you that the story that we have to tell is a story of grace. And so we thank you for the forgiveness that you offer freely to us through the blood of Jesus Christ, we receive that forgiveness. And God, my prayer is that that forgiveness will empower us to go off into the world and tell the story. Imperfect vessels, even though we are, we know that this is our mission, this is our purpose, this is our calling. So Holy Spirit, I pray even now you begin to plant ideas of a neighbor that we can love this week, of a friend that we can share the gospel with this week, of a coworker who who just needs an ear to talk to. God, fill us with these ideas so that we can go from this place to love our neighbors, to be a good neighbor, and to most of all, share the love of Jesus with them. And God, we thank you for the love of Jesus and it's in his mighty name that we pray. Amen.